armed forces was easy, everyone would be doing it. Living for years away from your own home, if you have a family, then not seeing them, told, uh, being told uh, where to go, what to do, how to do it, putting your life on the line, being stationed in places where the local community can resent you being there. There would even be peer pressure to behave in a certain way. And while you are in service, you can't, you shouldn't really get too close to the locals. But even as a soldier serving in a foreign land, you can display surprising, amazing faith. Let me pray. Jesus, as we come around your word now, would you refresh in us an understanding and a vibrancy and a desire to grow in our relationship with you? Holy Spirit, would you move amongst us wherever you have placed us today? And would you speak to our spirits deep to deep and be at work in your ongoing desire to help us to live life well, to transform our lives for your glory? Amen. Well, it's been suggested that there are approximately um, 255,000 people, in men in the Roman army um, around the time when Jesus was born. Approximately three times the size of the Australia's um, full and reserve defence forces. The Roman army was a mix of Roman citizens and those in whom the land um, had been acquired or taken over or conquered by the Roman Empire. It was a rare occurrence, not never impossible, but it was a rare occurrence that a Jewish person would ever join the Roman army in Jesus' day. They would have been regarded as a sellout, um, as assimilating with the enemy, as it were, and uh, the occupier of their nation of Israel. And so they might have been people that were born to mixed parentage, living in um, a land away from Israel and joining the Roman army there to help make ends meet. As we've noted previously, there was general resentment about the outright um, through to there was general resentment through to outright rebelliousness towards the Roman occupation of Israel. Now Rome was happy to put a stamp on their authority over Israel. Adjoining the Jewish temple precinct was the Roman Antonia Fortress. And it had a commanding view overlooking the temple area. But it was also the location where the priest's garbs, the priest's vestments, the, the priestly robes were kept. They were the things that the priests had to wear if they were to serve in the temple. Further marking Roman authority over Jewish religious practices. You can just imagine it. The Israelite priest would have to go to the Romans to get access to their priestly robes before they could perform their religious responsibilities. Every time the priests went, it would have served to reinforce the Roman authority even over the Jewish religious practices of the day. How belittling was that? So, in the Roman Empire region that included Israel, there was approximately five Roman army cohorts, each made up of around 480 Roman soldiers, some 2,400 Roman soldiers in all. This meant that there would have been around 20 to 30 Roman officers or centurions or centurio who commanded 80 regular soldiers or legionaries um, in that region that included Israel. A centurion was at least 30 years of age and had hero-like status because of their bravery and their willingness to lead his men into battle. 
They were the first to go over the enemy wall or were sent on a mission into enemy territory to assassinate someone or to help um, you know, see what sort of reconnaissance they could do in that area as well. Vegetius described the centurion like this. The centurion is the infant, um, in the infantry is chosen for his size, so that rules me out. His strength, that rules me out. His dexterity, that rules me out as well. Um, in throwing missiles, uh, missile weapons, and for all his skill in uh, the use of his sword and shield. In short, for his expertness in all the exercises. He was to be vigilant temperate, active, and readier to execute the orders he received than to talk, strict in and exercising, um, exercising and keeping up proper discipline among his soldiers, in obliging them to appear clean and well-dressed and to have their weapons um, constantly rubbed and bright at the ready. A centurion also had a reputation of brutal enforcement on their own men and on others around them. They had a reputation of high expectations and also harsh discipline, demanding like a drill sergeant. The men they commanded and their discipline and skills uh, reflected heavily on their set, the role of the centurion. And so if his men didn't perform, then that didn't go well for the centurion. And so everything that he did was exact and demanding on those he led. Yet as we soon discover from Matthew 8, crackerjack, disciplined, and a hardened centurion could still surprise. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 8. Soon after Jesus finished his Sermon on the Mount, which speaks about the values of the kingdom of God, Jesus heads to his home base of Capernaum at the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee, which, as we will discover, is also Matthew, the writer of this gospel, his hometown as well. Now, Matthew does a really interesting thing here. Uh, in this account of Jesus' life and ministry. You see, he places two people at the opposite ends of the social spectrum right against each other. A leper, an untouchable, um, and an outcast of society is placed right before a highly regarded, respected, and feared centurion. Once again, Matthew is making a point here in the way he collates the stories around Jesus' life and who Jesus is for. Matthew 8, verse 5. When Jesus returned to Capernaum, a Roman officer, a centurion, came and pleaded with him, Lord, my young servant lies in bed paralysed and in terrible pain. Now, Luke chapter 7 gives a little bit more detail. Dr. Luke notes that the young slave or servant is both valuable but also near death. Some suspect he had a severe case of polio. The Roman centurion has some res respected elders in Luke's account advocate for him. If anyone deserves help, they say, um, and if anyone deserves your help, he does, for he loves the Jewish people and even built a synagogue for us, they account to Jesus. For Matthew, the sending of someone was the same as asking oneself. Matthew also wants to focus on the amazing account rather than the worthiness of the Roman centurion. His servant is bedridden, paralysed, and in terrible pain. The Roman has heard of Jesus' reputation. In Matthew chapter 4, Jesus is already noted as healing um, every kind of disease. Whoever people brought to Jesus, including the paralyzed, in Matthew chapter 4, verse 25, Jesus was able to heal. 
and word had gotten out about this Jesus. So, it is to this proven healer that the centurion asks for help. While Matthew sticks to the facts, young servant in bed, paralyzed and in terrible pain, the implied request is there. Can you, would you have mercy on me, have mercy on him and heal him? Jesus responds in, in Matthew 8 verse 7. Jesus said, I will come and heal him. These words would have brought relief to the centurion, but resistance from the crowd. This is a Gentile. This is a non-Jew. This is a Roman soldier, part of the occupying force of Israel. This is who we have to go to. These people, this kind of person. These are the people that we have to go to, to even ask for permission to conduct our religious services. And you're going to this enemy of our nation to do something for him? For Jesus to go into this man's house, to enter it would have made Jesus ritually unclean and unable to engage in worship practices until the cleansing period had been completed. You go? You've got to be kidding. But the Roman centurion also knew that it would have been unheard of um, for, for Jesus and also unacceptable for the Jewish people if Jesus was to go to him. So he responds in verse 8. But the officer said, Lord, I'm not worthy to have you come into my house. Just say the word from where you are and my chosen servant will be healed. I know this because I am, a, um, I am under the authority of my superior officers and I have the authority over my soldiers. I only need to say, go, and they go, or come, and they come. And if I say to my slaves, do this, they do it. Remember the commentary around what a centurion was like? He is to be vigilant, temperate, active, and readier to execute the orders he receives than to talk. Such was this century. I know what authority looks like. I've seen it. I've experienced it. I've lived it. And you, Jesus, I can see in you that you have authority. You have the power to heal. You have the authority to heal. But not only that, this centurion also has the faith to believe that Jesus can heal from a distance. Something that has been untested and untried before now. And that the recipient of the healing, uh, for any recipient of any healing by Jesus so far in Matthew. And it is a Roman who recognises this in Jesus and is prepared to believe it and act on it. Surprised. Amazed. It's not a word that we commonly attribute to um, being exp experienced by Jesus. By others? Absolutely, yeah. Um, in Matthew 8, 27. In Matthew 9, 33, people are amazed by Jesus. In Matthew 15, 31, 21, 20. In Matthew 22, 22. In Matthew 27, 14. All these times, people are amazed by Jesus. In Matthew, in, sorry, in Mark 6, 6, Jesus is amazed at the level of unbelief of his hometown crew, people that he grew up with in Nazareth. But here, in Jesus' ministry home base, he is amazed at the level of faith of a Roman occupier of his country, a Roman centurion in fact it is the only time that jesus is positively amazed at someone's level of faith and it is the level of faith in a non-jew a gentile occupying soldier such is the level of faith that the roman officer is prepared 
to press into what is untried and untested. Never before, but why not now? If ever we needed it, it was now. But before Jesus turns his attention to the request, there's also a teaching opportunity for the crowds around Jesus. While their jaws are already a little bit open at Jesus' willingness to respond to this request from this Roman officer, Jesus wants to make sure that their jaws are firmly embedded into the Capernaum floor. In verse 10, when Jesus heard this, he, he was amazed. Turning to those who were following him, he said, I tell you the truth. I haven't seen faith like this in all of Israel. And I tell you this, that many Gentiles will come from all over the world, from east and west, and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob at the feast of the kingdom of heaven. But many Israelites, those for whom the kingdom was prepared, will be thrown into outer darkness, where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. The Jewish belief of the day was that the Gentiles would get a front row seat at this feast, that they would see, that they would be able to smell, that they would be able to see this eschatological great feast of the end of the age take place. They would have a front row seat to God feasting with the Israelite nation, represented in Abraham, in Isaac, and in Jacob. For the Israelites, the Gentiles would watch God's people feast, but not be a part of it. But here, Jesus is saying to the Gentiles, pull up a chair at my table. But to the many Israelites, because of their lack of faith, because of their unwillingness to believe in Jesus, because they relied on their DNA. I'm born into this. I don't have to believe. I don't have to respond. I don't have to trust and obey. To those who don't have a personal relationship with God's rescuer, there would only be heartbreak and separation from God. Then while the crowd are busy trying to grapple with the what the, moment jesus returns his attention to the roman centurion's request in verse 13 then jesus said to the roman officer go back home because you have believed it has happened and the young servant was healed that same hour jesus responds to amazing faith with amazing grace because you believe. The reality is that, that while Jesus was amazed by the Roman centurion's faith, and it was indeed noteworthy, Jesus rest responded because of faith, not because of the size of his faith. And that should bring us comfort. You see, too often we hear stories about the size of faith and that it's because of the level of faith that things happen. But we get tricked into thinking this and then we start thinking that um, the size of our faith is what makes the difference when it's in reality who we have faith in that makes a difference. Even when it's small, fragile faith, it's who we have faith in that makes a difference. Oh, and just because we have faith, big or small, does not mean that we always get what we want either. One of Jesus' early followers, Paul, who had faith to bring someone back to life, who had faith to heal the sick, who had faith to overcome the poison of a snake bite, asking for a met metaphorical thorn in his flesh to be removed in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 to 9. In verse 8, Paul writes, three times I begged the Lord to take it away. Each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I'm glad to boast about my weaknesses 
so that the power of Christ can work through me. And the passage that leads into what Leah read earlier in our service today, in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 32 to chapter 12, verse 3, we read this. How much more do I need to say? It would take too long to recount the stories of faith of Gideon, of Barak, of Samson, of Japha, of David, of Samuel, and all the prophets. By faith, these people overthrew kingdoms, ruled with justice, and received what God had promised them. They shut the mouths of lion, quenched the flames of fire, and escaped death by the edge of the sword. Their weaknesses were turned into strength. They became strong in battle and put, on, put whole armies to flight. Women received their loved ones back from death, back again from death. Then he goes on to write, but others were tortured, refusing to turn from God in order to be set free. They placed their hope in a better life after the resurrection. Some were jeered at and their backs were cut open with whips. Others were chained in prison. Some died by stoning. Some were sawn in half and others killed with the sword. Some went about wearing skins of sheep and goats, destitute and oppressed and mistreated. They were too good for this world, wandering over deserts and mountains, hiding in caves and holes in the ground. All these people earned a good reputation because of their faith. Yet none of them received all that God had promised, for God had something better in mind for us, that they would not reach perfection without us therefore therefore since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith let us strip off every weight that slows us down especially the sin that so easily trips us up and let us run with endurance the race that god has set before us we do this by keeping our eyes on jesus the champion who initiates and perfects our faith because of the joy awaiting him. He endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honour beside God's throne. Think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people. Then you won't become weary and give up. Amazing faith. Wouldn't it be cool? Just think about it for a moment. Wouldn't it be cool if we could surprise Jesus by our faith. If we could amaze Jesus by our faith, what might that be like? What could that look like for you? Stripping off what slows you down, slows you down from following Jesus, growing in endurance. You trip, you fall, you pick yourself up. You get going again. You press on, keeping your eyes on Jesus. And then building on that, stepping out again and again in faith and surprising and amazing and bringing a smile to the face of Jesus. Let me pray. Jesus, we've heard a little bit of a story of a, a person that was deemed to be so distant from you that had such a deep, rich, and an amazing faith. Lord, as we have been reminded already in our service today, we pray for those who are followers of you in our defence forces, especially for those chaplains that serve and seek to honour you and to seek to remind people of your love. For those that are struggling with the, 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 the impact of war and the impact of what it's meant for them to be in the defence force, for families that are separated. As we've been reminded of the centurion today, we are also wanting to remember these people in the Australian Defence Force today. But Lord, we also ask that you would continue to do a work in us 
that we might be people known for our amazing faith. Our willingness to trust you when all may seem lost. Our willingness to take steps, to take risks out of our desire to follow you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So how might we respond today? Whether you're here in the auditorium with those response cards or at home through the chat function on Zoom, how might we respond today? For those that might be listening later, we'd love to hear your thoughts about what God's been saying to you today. Perhaps like the Roman centurion, there might be cause for us not to see another culture as the enemy, but rather an invitation to see God at work. There may be some culture that when you see them, you build up some resistance. What's God wanting to say to you about how he wants to invite you to look at them and to look at those opportunities differently? Perhaps for you, life is just stuck at the moment. What is a step, even a small step, but what is a step of faith that you can take today? Is there a faith conversation that could be had with another person? Someone that doesn't know Jesus. Can I encourage you to pray for an opportunity, but then to take a step of faith and engage in that opportunity to have those conversations when they come? Write a prayer of response today through those response cards or through the chat. We're going to have some music played, and as we do, I invite you to um, take this opportunity to spend some time with God in this way. God bless you.